Hey folks, I'm here, uh, Donna Malieri, the program, one of the program managers on Azure Functions, uh, here with Azure Functions Live, and today I'm joined by Matt Mason, one of the developers on our team. Hey guys. He's the one who actually does all the great work that uh, yeah. Chris and I get to demo. <laughs> now, based on customer feedback, we got some negative uh, feedback about Chris being on the show, so that's why we replaced him, and you can see that we're listening to your feedback and actually making changes. Um, He's a little sad in the corner right now. I'm but. still here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Everybody gave us great feedback about Chris, but we wanted to That's shake things up too. a little yeah. bit. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to shake things up a little bit and have a developer who actually works on the product show off his great stuff. So uh, what I'm going to show you today is a cool demo that I've been working on, which uses uh, Cognitive Services Custom Vision APIs. Now, this is a completely unique service that uh, no one else has. And what it lets you do is train photos. Uh, let me just show you the uh, UI that you get for Custom Vision. You get to train the service on your own set of photos and get more detailed sets of information about that. So, for instance, um, if you have a photo of a sunflower, um, you know, you, you'll just get flower, most likely. Uh, but if you use custom training uh, with the, vision, the custom vision APIs, then you can get more specific. Another good use is landmarks. So I've trained uh, four different Seattle landmarks with the custom vision API, and I'm going to show you that today. So, um, you know, there's the Space Needle, Experience Music Project, that kind of thing. And the demo I'm going to show you is pretty simple. Um, it is a photo mosaic generator. You upload a photo, and if it happens to be one of these ones that we've trained, uh, if it has a high confidence that's what it is, it will then do a Bing image search based on what it recognizes. So if you upload a photo of the Space Needle, it'll do a Bing image search of the Space Needle. Now, if you upload a photo of a regular needle, it'll, it'll not match, and so it'll do a regular vision search. Then the cool thing is um, it'll get 100 Bing images and it will generate a mosaic of your input image using those images. So basically you will get a space needle composed of little tiny space needles, which is not necessarily the most practical demo in the world, but does show off all of the cool things that you can do with functions. Uh, plus I'm using Skia Sharp, which means that it's portable. So I will be able to run this on my Mac with the cross-platform uh, Azure Functions core tools when that's available. So without further ado, let's get started. So if you take a look at the UI, it looks surprisingly similar to coder cards. Um, in fact, it is the same, basically the same UI, um, but I, I changed some icons around and changed the UI just a little bit. So what you do is you choose a file. Um, so let's just, let's just show off what it does. So I have a photo here of Pike Place Market. Let me, let me show you on my computer, because this is actually a beautiful photo that is showing, um, uh, oh, okay. So let's, let's, let's not use photos. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's currently updating. So let's use uh, paint.net um, and zoom in here. And you can see it's really cool. It's actually like a time-lapse photo with uh, the, the cars moving around and stuff. So I, I really liked this photo. Um, so what I'm going to do is choose that. Um, and what this does is it calls an HTTP trigger on the function that's running, uh, which then creates a new queue message that says, hey, analyze this photo and create a mosaic of it. So you can see here that it says with a very high probability uh, that it's Pike Place Market, which is pretty cool because this is not one of my training images. Uh, and now it's created a mosaic. And so let's take a look at that here. Um, and what we'll do, instead of using photos, because it's updating, that's interesting, because I've never seen that message before. Um, well, let's look at it in paint.net, um, our trusty old desktop app. If you zoom in here, you will see that I have 20 by 20 images of Pike Place Market that are, that are um, the components of this image. So it's pretty fun. Now, the other thing that you can do is enter a search term manually. So what I'm going to do is upload the functions logo um, here. And I apparently it's not in that folder. Ah, I know where it is. 
here we go. Uh, Azure Functions logo. And oh, so it's actually, I forgot to put in the text. Let's try that again. Um, let's make it out of um, lightning bolts. And let's put in the logo. So we'll get two images returned. We can look at the output while we're doing this. So the first time um, it uh, would have tried to use custom vision and it would not have uh, figured out what it was. So you see here, it says that the best match that it could come up with for that first one was Space Needle, but it has basically a zero probability of being a Space Needle, which is good. Um, I guess that's the most closest thing that was in that list. Uh, so it says falling back to the, to the vision service, and this is the caption that we get, a close-up of a sign. And so there can be two uh, photo mosaics generated here. The first one is the functions logo with um, a bunch of signs, which is interesting. Um, and if we give it another minute, it'll um, do uh, the other one, which it looks like the photo is just not updating. Oh, there it is. There we go. And so this one's way cooler. Paint 3D is not updating it, but it's taking a minute. There we go. So um, th now this thing is really fun because if you zoom in, um, you'll see some familiar logo. For those of you who are old enough, not everybody is. You will see uh, the Winamp logo in here, which is is definitely fun. Um, so so that's the that's the demo. Let's look at the code. So I'm going to switch back to Visual Studio. I'll stop the debugger, and let's take a look at what this code is doing. Um, so the the main uh, part of code here is the um, the main bulk of this project, of course, is generating the mosaic itself. But uh, that's not really related to functions, so I'm not going to show you that code. But this is all open source and on GitHub, so you can take a look. So what I'm doing first is that I've created an HTTP function so that my website can easily call the function and not have to create a queue message, because I just have a spa that can be hosted on Azure Storage. Uh, so I have an HTTP trigger that just writes that same exact message, that same exact mosaic request message. Uh, to a queue, and that, but just by returning the value. Um, I have a settings API that tells the um, website uh, what containers to use for uploading the image, and it also a SAS token so they can upload that photo. Um, and then here is the main function, which is create mosaic. And so this is a queue trigger. Uh, it listens on the queue, generate mosaic. Notice here I'm using percent signs for the input container. So that means it's going to be a value that's in uh, the local settings file. So here I can change this based on what environment I'm using. This could be really useful. And here I'm binding to input image. If we look at mosaic request, we can see it has two properties, input image and image content string. This one's optional. That's if you filled out that text box. Uh, so what that means is that those properties you can now use in binding. So here I can use it in the binding for the source image and also as the name to use for the output image. Um, so basically, what I'm going to do is, if you haven't um, uh, provided an image content string, or if you haven't provided the custom vision URL, or if uh, the probability is just, is just very, very low um, by returning an empty string, that's what prediction image async does, then it will do a regular image analysis. So here it's saying analyze image async, and that is going to call the vision service. Now, it's actually just as easy to call the custom vision service. Just a little bit um, more work because you have to, um, there's no API SDK that wraps it. So you just have to make an HTTP request yourself, which is still pretty easy. Um, and so you just upload a byte array, and then you get the results. And what it does is it gives you a JSON array of the various tags that you have trained that particular model with. Um, you have these different projects, basically, that you can point to. And uh, what I'm going to do is, if the probability is at least 10%, then I will return the tap tag. Otherwise, I will return an empty string. So that's how that's all working. And then uh, what I'm going to do is use Bing Image Search to download uh, images that match 
that particular keyword. And the cool thing is that Bing Image Search actually has um, some query string parameters that I'm using here where you can actually resize the tile down to the size that you want. Um, so if you play with this sample, you can change it to different size of tile. Here I'm doing 20 by 20, but you can make it smaller or bigger. Uh, the smaller you make it, the more fine and more um, natural the image is going to look. So um, once we've downloaded all the images, we basically put them into a particular container. Um, we are going to hash, if you can see here, we're using a stable hash function. We're going to hash the query string, uh, and then we're going to save that in storage. It's going to save 100 images in storage, and then it's going to use those to generate the mosaic. And that code, um, I don't need to necessarily go into in great detail, but basically um, it's going to go, I'm binding to a cloud blob container. Um, that's actually a thing I should mention here, which is pretty interesting. Um, since I, I don't want to bind to all the blobs individually within that container, I can bind to the container and then iterate through everything. So I'm doing that here with my container mapping. And then basically I'm going to read all those into memory because uh, they're really tiny, they're less than 1K. And uh, based on the predominant color in each section of the image, I'm going to find the closest match of the matching tile. And so that's, that's how it all works. Um, I'll do one more demo just for fun. What do you think I should show off, Matt? I'd love to, with I think the, the forest fires right now, maybe we could uh, do something to celebrate that. Yeah, the there's a lot of forest fires <laughs> yeah. out in this area. So um, let's do, um, um, why don't we do the Space Needle? With forest fires. Oh God! <laughs> uh, I'll just say fire. How about that? Fire. Sounds good. Fire and uh, the space needle, and uh, and that's just because I don't have that many photos that are on my computer. So I could download another one. Um, oh, it looks like I have only the Empire State Building, Cats, mm. and Pike Place Market. So. Um, Let's let's go with or sorry. Uh, I also have the Chrysler Building. Let, let's skip buildings on fire. Yeah, I know it, it, it didn't work. Um. No, no, no. It's okay though. We can use the Azure Functions logo with fire. The serverless is hot. No, yes, the serverless like is that. hot. There we I go. Like that. There we go. So um, let's let's. Uh, oh, the function the app's not actually running. So let me, let me press F five. And this will run the functions tools locally. And since I made a minor edit, it's uh, rebuilding. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll refresh. Let's take it a second. Here we go. Uh, so one of the new features that Chris actually added is that if it can't connect to the function's host, it shows this text in red and it says offline, which is very useful uh, if you forget to run the function's host. Here we go. So now it is working. So let's do fire and we'll do the function's logo because serverless is hot. Um, and you can see that um, it's going to use that query. And this is the query hash. So basically, if I go look in storage, uh, this is basically for debugging for me. If I go look in storage, I will see a folder with that name, um, and I can see all the images that it shows. And in just a second, we will see the image analysis come back. It takes a little, it's a little very compute intensive depending on the size of the input image. So that's why we're using the queue. Uh, another thing that we could potentially do is use the HTTP async pattern with durable functions. And in that case, what I could do is return uh, basically a location that the client can pull on and wait to see when there's a result. So that's another uh, great pattern. In this case, I'm just going to immediately return a 200 response, and uh, the client can just pull on the queue, excuse me, the blob, where the output image is supposed to be. All right, so that worked out, and here we go. Uh, we've got a Functions logo made of fire. Um, which, which is actually pretty pretty cool. So uh, I encourage you to clone this repo and try it out and uh, you know see all the fun mosaics you can make and please tweet them out and uh, use the Azure Functions hashtag. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Matt and he's going to talk about some awesome new stuff that we're doing for Node. 
Oh, yeah, thanks, Donna. That was a great demo there. Sorry about the forest fire oh, uh, yeah. suggestion. It, it didn't work out. but Okay, so basically I want to talk about um, language extensibility and then the enhancements that that's going to bring for Node. So right now, kind of the world we live in is we have this function host that runs on you know your various function instances. <clears throat> and that host, when it's actually calling a node function, it's going through this um, C++ interconnect layer called EdgeJS. So all, what all this means is that it's running node in process with your C sharp. The problems this gives us is that we have to run with a compiled version of node. So that means that you can't do things like change your node version. You can't do things like use native modules. We're all very constrained in how we operate in this environment. Um, moving beyond node, you look and you see, for example, if you're running Python or PHP, um, these functions, they don't really start with a hot process. So every time you have to you know, run Python, run PHP, and so that's like a huge performance strain on your actual function. So right now we kind of have the world in, I guess, three main classes. You have you know, your .NET languages that are you know, in process, pretty well supported. You have Node, which is also in process, has a little bit of this you know, extra richer types and, and a hot process. Uh, and then you have your other languages that are you know, just kind of second class citizens. And so what we've been trying to do is, you know, through extensibility and these enhancements, is make it so that everything is just better supported and it's, it's easier, well, really to get more fine-grained control. Um, this is actually useful for .NET as well. Um, so customers uh, running your code in the same process means that you can't use binding redirects, which, which sucks. Uh, uh, you want to use a different version of your soft JSON and you can't. And uh, you will often get very bad error messages if you try to do that. So this out of proc model helps everything across the board. It will help. It'll make it so we can uh, finally take um, Python out of it, the perpetual experimental and make an uh, true out of proc model. And for .NET, we'll have a separate worker process uh, that Matt will explain. And then you can have binding redirects. So there's a ton of advantages beyond just lighting up new languages. Yeah, I think I think Donna summarized that really well. A lot of it is it's really about providing more control. We want to give you guys control of you know how your code is executing the execution environment. So choose your own version of Node or have the binding redirects you want. For example, um, it's also you know it's nice because by moving to this finer grained control model, you can enable things like bring your own language. Right? If we have more separation, so everything's not running in the same process then it's much easier for have, us to have a hard API layer so you could implement you know, uh, your own language worker NuGet, for example. That's, that's our idea here. And then you just have that loaded much like a BYOB, you know, uh, bring your own binding NuGet would be. Um, and then all of a sudden you can run in your function app using these new functions uh, in your execution environment. Um, it's also, since it's decoupled, you can do other things with it. If you wanted to run on you know, Azure container instances or web apps containers, you could do this as well. You know, it's not quite there yet, but that's, that's the long-term vision. Um, so, and yeah, providing that hot worker performance. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, just kind of a little summary about one of the best architecture diagrams I'm sure you've ever seen. Um, in, in a previous world, we lived really where everything was just in the host. But now, essentially, we've added an RPC layer that provides abstractions like you know starting a worker, um, like a function, load a function, you know start an invocation, log streaming between the two, um, and all this is handled with you know um, you know intelligent process retries and error handling, so that you get some robustness from these workers. Um, so with that in mind. Um, I guess basically I want to show you a little bit of how this works in, in a new node world. So um, in the past I was saying you couldn't use you know, your own version of node. We've been locked to 6.5.0 for a long time. Um, and you can't use native modules, for example. So uh, let me show you a demo here on my, uh, on my Mac of just doing just that. So I've got your basic um, node HTTP function, kind of what, what pops up all the time, you know, HTTP trigger, process to request, you know, what's your name. 
Um, so what I've changed here though is that I'm using bcrypt, which in the past you haven't been able to use in functions because there's no way for you to compile native modules for them. Um, so now um, it's it's a very simple demo, but you know once we have a name on the query string, we'll provide you a body back with that name. We'll run a hash function on it, and we'll show you the process version this is executing in. So let's just make sure uh, if we look at package JSON. Um, just make sure these node modules are installed. Okay, so we have all those packages there. Um, and I'm going to start up the worker process for us. So we can see here is. You know, we're listing that HTTP trigger function we had. We are listening on um, I believe it's always a uh, localhost 5000. So let's give that a shot. Okay, yeah, so pass the name in the query string. Um, and uh, this view isn't too good, so let's take a look here. So we'll do logos 5000 API HTTP trigger, and uh, let's let's go Matt Mason. So okay, we got the response back, Matt Mason. We got the bcrypt hash, and then we got it's running in version 8.4.0 Node. So all of a sudden, you can be up to date in the Node version you want. You can use the Node um, native modules you want. Um, it gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, so what you just showed off was basically running an HTTP trigger with um, the Azure Functions host running on .NET Core on your Mac, and you've now used a custom version of Node here. Yeah. There we yeah. go. Awesome. So even though it's just the Hello World API, uh, what it actually is it's showing off is pretty impressive. Yeah, it's you could build a much more impressive demo on top of it certainly, but the the core is there and it should work for Node for some other languages as well. So awesome. you know, looking forward to getting a lot more out with this. So. Your browser just zoom in a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Oh, just to make it easier. Just the sure. screen so everyone can And see. we're working on um, getting this working in a preview. Very soon, uh, the the core tools demo that I showed in the last um, screencast, we was actually only for .NET at the time, and we're working on getting a preview version of this. Uh, basically, what Matt is showing off, so that you can run on your own computer on a Mac or on Windows, because it's going to all be with .NET Core. Yeah, I think that should hopefully be out um, in the next couple of weeks at yeah. least. So. so so stay tuned on Twitter and our events, our upcoming events. Uh, we've got a ton of upcoming events. In fact, I have so many talks that I'm giving uh, that I made a GitHub repo with all of them listed. Uh, so I'm actually going to be at Dev Intersection um, in Europe uh, next week, uh, or sorry, the week after next. I'll be talking about app service and functions. So for our viewers in Europe, please check that out if you can. Uh, and then we have Microsoft Ignite. We have a ton of announcements which obviously I'm not going to tell you about now, but you definitely should either uh, attend or watch the live streams or the, the videos when they're available. Um, and then after that, we have Java One and Serverless Conf. So um, we'll, be, we'll be demoing a lot more of this stuff and uh, really a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Um, and this is just a tiny taste of the direction in which we're headed with the product. Uh, also, if you are in the New York area or want to go to the New York area, we have a full day workshop um, in October, on October 11th or 10th, something like that. Um, I'll look it up and we'll put the note, put it in the notes for the YouTube video. Um, we have a full day hands-on workshop. Um, in fact, the photo mosaic sample that I just worked on was in preparation for that uh, event. So uh, you'll see a bunch more examples, um, including, uh, you know, a Slack channel that where you can vote on what kind of food to have or uh, creating a GitHub issue automatically from a Slack slash command or a team slash command. Um, and so it's uh, going to be pretty cool. So definitely sign up for that uh, if you are available. 
uh, and the videos for serverless comp will also become available about a month after the event. So be sure to check those out. Are there any questions? Yeah, we have a couple awesome. questions, and hopefully we'll get more in, uh, in the meantime. One from Attila. Can I have a setting for security where I can refuse any calls coming from outside of my domain, like direct calls from Postman or any other app? So uh, not really. Um, well, yes and no. So there is a solution that you can use, but it might be a little too heavyweight for what you're looking for. So functions, Azure Functions can run in an app service environment which means that you can completely control the front end of your process. When you're running uh, in the regular consumption or regular app service plan, you actually have a shared front end that we, we have a multi-tenant front end basically. It's shared across everyone. So you can't put a firewall in front of that. If you use an app service environment, you can. Uh, the other thing that you can do is use API keys. If you're on a consumption or regular app service plan, you can use API keys to control access. But in terms of IP address level blocking, uh, in terms of what the client is, you, you really have to use something that blocks it at the front end level. Anything right. else? One more question here from uh, C. Parker. Um, if he put, uh, puts items in a queue, like email addresses that should be added to a marketing list, can we act on those queued items as a single array in a function? Or does they have to do a uh, function do one at a time? So with queues, at least, functions have to do one at a time. This is a lot. Um, this is a lot just because of the kind of queue API that we are given. Uh, I mean, when you look at it, you're triggered by a single queue message. Um, so that is part of the issue. There may be. Can you actually, use another service for this? There may be a. Uh, well, yeah, it's it's honestly probably a case of not using the best service for right. for the job in this instance. Um, so for I mean what. Would you say for this? Event, event Hub um, definitely lets you do batching. Event right? Hub would let you do batching. One other thing I'd recommend, sorry, the person who's not on the camera, but you can use a service bus sessions. And so you can actually go oh. ahead and put a bunch of messages into a service bus session, and then just send a queue message pointing at that session when you're ready to go process that collection of items. And you can go ahead and process that session, not only um, in a batch, but in order. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's very nice, yeah. Um, there's probably also some tricks that you could do with aggregating the messages yourself, uh, but I think the session solution is probably going to be the most elegant. So thank you for that, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have more questions about that, just uh, reach out to him on Twitter, Crandy Codes. He can tell you how to do it. Maybe he'll write a little gist and show you how. <laughs> I'm just offering up work from him. <laughs> That's what I do when he's not on camera. Um, thank you, Donna. Any other questions? Question from Ryan here, running into some issues with binding redirects and referencing .NET standards 2.8 libraries. Yes. Yep. When can we expect these to be ironed out? So the fix is already in. We're going to be doing a deployment uh, very soon. Do you know the date on that? So it'll be, it'll be in the next, it'll, next deployment. Yeah, OK. So yes. next, next deployment. Oh, next, I, next. I think, no, I think it'll be coming out this, uh, the deployment we start this coming week. OK. That's what that yeah that is so, what Fabio told me. But if yeah. you wait a second, I will get him on IM and I will verify. Oh, he's but, also in chat. Uh, so oh well, great. Uh, so Fabio, what's the answer? <laughs> um, but if it's the next deployment, that will be um, I think within a week, right? Yeah. So yeah, we're working on that. The reason that there was a delay was because before the net standard was out of preview, we didn't want to actually take a dependency on it. And then um, we we just had other releases that were coming up, so we didn't get a chance to fully test that out, because we didn't want to regress any behavior there for customers. There's actually a great question here from uh, Maxime. Any way to know which staging slots I'm in from a trigger, from a timer trigger function? And in the chat window, Fabio actually answered those, uh, looking at the environment variable from the website uh, slot name. Yes, that's so what it was. Just to bring that out uh, in the live audience here. Awesome, awesome, yeah. So um, if you go, the, one of the cool tips, let me bring this up real quick. Um, the One of the nice things that you can do, if you want to know uh, like what, what You're values. You're not sharing your screen anymore. I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Hmm. Let's share my screen. So uh, what you can do is, um, Uh, is that working? Yeah. So if you go into one of your function apps, then you can go to the Kudu console for 
that app and you get to see all of the environment variables. That's actually one of the ways, if, if I have this question, that's actually probably how I would answer it is I would go to Kudu and I would say, oh, I see this value. And then I would go ask someone on my team, can I trust the value uh, will always be this kind of thing? And they will tell me whether or not you get safe to take a dependency on that. So here we type in Kudu, um, we will see the advanced tools and that will launch Kudu here. And I'll just take a second to authenticate and get the token. Uh, while that's bring, coming up, let me just show you my favorite new setting, which is the application settings is no longer a blade, it's a tab. So seeing your app settings is easier than ever. Um, and you can edit and add new settings right here, which is totally awesome. So great work uh, UX team for that. Uh, I actually uh, was out when that release came out and I just, just noticed, I was like, Wait, how, why is this better? This is this is just brand. This is somehow better, and I couldn't put my finger on why. So if I go to um, environment on Kudu, then I can see all of the environment variables, including like my connection strings. You can see that um, they actually get prefixed with a key um, with a uh, app setting, and then connection strings get prefixed with app setting. But if you look at uh, what's slot. App setting slight website app ah, app setting website slot name is production. So that's how you can tell which one it is. You can even see um, the site name as well if you need to use that in environment variable. So there's a ton of useful stuff here. And I believe there's also another environment variable without the app setting prefix. Yeah, you just load the next yes. one. Oh, good point. Slot. Thank you. Yeah, there's another one. All right, so um, that's it for this session. Unless there are any more questions. No more questions? Uh, one more uh, yeah. from, from Maxim. Um, so deep linking in the portal for tabs, uh, things like that. Uh, so can you clarify, does that mean um, you want to actually deep link into that app settings tab? Uh, Maxim, if you're able to. Yeah, if that's what you're, if, that's what, if that's what he's asking for, that's a great feature and I would love to have it. But unfortunately, um, because these are not, um, we're not in the Visa framework, we're using our own iframe basically, that's its own site. We don't have URLs that we can direct to, um, that we can directly link to in the app settings. If it was a blade, then we probably could, uh, but then our whole blade would have to be an iframe. Uh, sorry, not an iframe, but in the framework. So the specific issue is about uh, accidentally hitting F5 or initially hitting F5 and then realizing that everything goes away. Oh yes, that again is a, we have an ask actually to the Visa framework team to try to improve that. But um, that's definitely um, an issue I've run into myself. All right, so awesome. So we're going to have another webcast on uh, October 19th. And uh, I'm not sure who will be on it, but maybe we can wrangle Fabio since he's actually answering questions he on the really webcast. He likes that chat spot, Ex doesn't he? Yeah. He does, but I think I'm going to make it my mission to get him on here. So. Uh, if you're if you're curious, if you're interested in seeing Fabio, please mention it on Twitter. Uh, his, Twitter <laughs> his Twitter handle is Code Sapien, and just say I want Fabio in the next webcast, and and he will have to bow to customer demand because there's one thing he cares about is customers. So um, with that, thank you very much, and thanks for joining us, Matt. Thanks, guys.